Now, when we talk about the mass of an atom or a nucleus, we don't usually talk about kilograms, we talk about, well, just numbers. If we take helium, then we know that the atomic number is two, but the mass number is four. Now, what do we mean by mass number? Well, actually, this is relative atomic mass. But it doesn't have a unit, does it? Well, in reality, it actually does. The unit is the U. That is the relative atomic mass unit. Now, what is one U equals to? Well, relative atomic mass is actually based off carbon, specifically carbon-12. Now, carbon-12, we know, has six protons and six neutrons in it. So it has 12 nucleons. So what we say is, well, one of these has to be 1 12th the mass of a carbon-12 atom. So if you have an atom of carbon-12, that's protons, neutrons, and electrons, then one U, that's relative atomic mass unit, is gonna be 1 12th the mass of that. That must mean that we say that the mass of one proton is one U. One neutron is also one U. But in reality, these numbers aren't quite right. They're very, very close to one, but if we actually measure them to a very high degree of accuracy, we find this. We find the masses to be 1.007276U, and a neutron is actually even slightly heavier. Now you might say, well, it's pretty much one. I mean, to two sig figs, it's definitely one. But this is one of the very few times in physics where we have to go to a very high degree of precision, because the very small difference between these numbers actually makes all the difference. An electron, well, we say it weighs basically nothing compared to a neutron and a proton, but if we're talking about such a high degree of precision, then we need to take it into account as well. 0.000549U. Now, if we actually have an atom of helium, then we have two protons, two neutrons, and we have two electrons in orbit. What should the mass of this be? It should be equals two lots of this, plus two lots of this, plus two lots of this. Okay, I probably could have factorized for two, but this is just to show. It should be the mass of two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons added up together. Now, when we measure the mass of a helium atom, we find it to be this number here. What's weird is that the separate masses of the protons, neutrons, and electrons don't add up to this measured mass. They actually add up to slightly more. That means that there is a difference in the calculated mass of a helium atom from its constituents, protons, neutrons, and electrons, and its actual measured mass. We have what we call a mass defect. So let's look at those numbers again. We have the mass of constituents, and that was 4.032980U. And we have the actual mass of a helium atom. That's 4.002603U. Now we can see that the constituents separated out weigh more than the actual mass of them put together in a helium atom. And that's always the case. The total mass of the constituents is always going to be more than the mass when in a nucleus. Okay, we are talking about electrons as well, but we're mostly concerned about what's going on in the nucleus here. Now let's find out what the difference is. If we take one away from the other, we end up with 0.030377U. Zero, 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 this is what we call the mass defect. And we can give it the symbol delta M. So hang on a minute. So we're saying that if we take our protons, neutrons and electrons and shove them together, mass is lost in the process. But you should know from year one particles that if mass is lost, then it has to be turned into energy. How do we figure that out? Well, we do E, then take our mass defect, that's the mass lost, times by C squared. But the problem with this is that we have to convert it into kilograms first before we can use this equation. So actually, we don't have to use that, and I'll show you why in a minute. So if mass is lost and converted into energy when constituents come together to form an atom or a nucleus, then it stands to reason that if we want to separate out an atom or a nucleus into its constituents, then we have to put that energy back in to regain that mass, and that is true. And we call this energy the binding energy. And the definition is, it's the energy now we can say work as well. 
is the energy or work required to separate a nucleus or an atom into its constituents. Yes, that's the same amount of energy that is released when we go the other way as well. And obviously the bigger the atom or the bigger the nucleus, the more binding energy it has. The higher the binding energy for it is gonna be. So like we said, in order to use this, we need to say, take our mass defect in U, turn it into our mass defect in kilograms, and then E equals MC square it, and then we end up with joules. But there is a shortcut. Instead of having to convert to kilograms, we can go straight from relative atomic mass units into mega electron volts. To go the long way around, well, you need to times by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 27, then put that into there, times by three times 10 to the eight squared, etc. But the easy way of going from U to mega electron volts is to be times by 931.3. If one relative atomic mass unit of mass is converted into energy, that is the same as 931.3 mega electron volts. Mega electron volts being 1.6 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. So we have the mass defect for a helium atom, helium four atom. So let's try and find out how much energy that is. The binding energy for helium four, is just gonna be our mass defect in U, 0.0, .0. 30377 times by 931.3 that gives us 28.3 mega electron volts. If we wanted to convert this into joules, we just divide by the conversion factor here. By the way, you get given this conversion in your formula sheet, but it's a useful number to remember to speed things up. Ah, you might be thinking though, if you always have to put in energy to separate nuclei into their constituents, then how do we actually get energy out of nuclear fission? Well, yes, you're right. So it's all to do with what's happening with the total binding energy, what's going into a nuclear reaction and what's coming out. So let's go with fission first. So we have uranium-238, let's say, and that has a certain total binding energy. And we know that when this fissions, we end up with two daughter particles and two or three neutrons as well. So we have before and we have after. Now we know that when uranium-238 fissions, we have energy given out. In the process, the total binding energy has increased. In other words, it's going to require more energy to separate these out into their separate constituents to separate out the uranium-238 nucleus that we had to begin with. What's happened, the total binding energy has increased. So that means that overall mass has been lost. So where is that mass gone? It's been converted into energy. What about if we have two deuteriums and they get fused together to make helium? Once more, we know that energy is given out. In order for energy to be given out, once again, going from before to after, once again, the total binding energy has increased and mass is lost. Now, what do you notice about uranium? It's very heavy. It's heavier nuclei that will release energy when they are fissioned. If you try and fuse two heavy nuclei together, the problem is, is that you need to put more energy in to begin with. Same thing here, it's light nuclei that release lots of energy when they're fused together. If you try to fission light nuclei, again, you're having to put in more energy then you're getting out. It's worth saying one last thing, that is to say that if the total binding energy has increased, then that means our products are more stable. So it's all to do with not just binding energy, but the binding energy per nucleon. Binding energy per nucleon is, is what it says on the 10. It's the binding energy of a nucleus divided by the number of nucleons in it. What we can do is draw a graph to see how the binding energy per nucleon changes for nuclei. And uh, this here is A, that's uh, the number of nucleons. So we start over on the left hand side here. Makes sense that if we start off very, very light, then there's not gonna be much binding energy per nucleon. But as we go higher, we see this happening. As we look at nuclei that have more nucleons, the binding energy per nucleon increases. Now we actually have a little bump there, and then it carries on going, but then it does reach a maximum and then come back down again. 
Our maximum is here. That's our nucleon number of 56. In fact, the atom with the highest binding energy per nucleon is iron 56. Now, like we said earlier, something that has a higher binding energy per nucleon is more stable. So naturally, nuclei that are lighter than iron 56 are going to fuse together to go towards iron 56, because that means that their binding energy per nucleon is increasing. Once you go past here, isotopes don't naturally fuse, they fission. Because again, to become more stable, they have to have a higher binding energy per nucleon. So long as you're trying to fuse nuclei to the left of iron and fission elements to the right of iron, then you are going to get net energy released. Now what's this bump up here? This is helium. Now helium has an uncharacteristically high binding energy per nucleon. So that means that it's unusually stable compared to its immediate neighbors. So that kind of explains why when we have unstable nuclei, quite often they emit alpha radiation. They emit a helium nucleus because that's a very stable thing with a high binding energy to give out. So there you have it. That's what binding energy and mass defect is all about. I hope you found that useful. If you did, then please leave a like. And if you have any comments or questions, leave them down below. And I'll see you next time.